I'm here with Stanley Ritchie. Stanley is a distinguished professor at the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. He has a long career as a Baroque violinist and as a as a modern violinist, and it's stupid of me to introduce him to you because he's much better known than I am. So, Stanley, it's a great pleasure to see you and hear you here today. Uh, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, we're interested in uh, anything you care to tell us, but can you say something about uh, how you got started in music and maybe even bring it up far enough to say how you got interested in this early music, Baroque violin business? Certainly, yes. <laughs> Well, being born as I was in a rural community in Australia um, where there was no music, and there was no, the only, the only music teachers were the nuns in the local convent, all of whom were pianists. So I had eight years of training, my first eight years on the violin from people who didn't know how to play it. Somehow I guess I had some talent and um, Eventually, I opted to go to the City Conservatorium when I graduated from high school. And um, I, finally, I had a real violin teacher. <laughs> and he was, he was one who had been one of the, the uh, examiners who used to come out annually, who was the only one that downgraded me. I was always getting honors and so on. And then he downgraded me and told my teacher that I was lazy. And so of course, I gravitated to him when I decided to. <laughs> it's interesting, and you know, and he he brought me from, you know, the Bach E major concerto to the to, um, the Tchaikovsky, which was my graduation piece, you know, in five years. And um, anyhow, so I had um, a French government scholarship, and I decided to take that up, and then I went to Paris and studied there for a year and um, and during that time I happened to meet uh, the, the niece of Joseph Fuchs um, who uh, was teaching at Juilliard still at that time and she said oh I can get you a scholarship to study with Uncle Joe and I said go on and she did so suddenly here I am at, at Yale you know it's, uh, without ever having intended to, to come to the United States in the first place so um, the experience at Yale was very interesting because I, I heard a term that I had never heard before, performance practice. And the, one, the one course that I stuck with in the one year that I was there as a special student it was really eye-opening for me. And um, although it was uh, 10 years before anything else happened in that uh, vein, I... Um, um, well, let's say I had a, a normal modern violin professional life uh, for the next 10 years or so, and um, eventually wound up as uh, uh, Associate Concertmaster of Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in, from 1970 to 75. And um, I finally managed to escape from the Met. Um, I mean, I say that because it was the highest paid auction in the world at that time. It may still be for, I don't know, well, maybe no longer. But anyway, um, I, I uh, went out into the, the freelance world in New York and was a member of a group called the New York Chamber Soloists. I don't know whether they're still in existence. But um, one of the members of that group was Albert Fuller, who had been teaching for 40 years at Juilliard um, and um, uh, I said to uh, to Albert Harpsichordis, I said, hey, you know, I'd really like to know more about Baroque music. Can we get together and read some Corelli sonatas or something sometime? And he said, when? <laughs> and we, I, I, um, I said, okay, I made an appointment with him. We went to his apartment and he showed me, um, he told me then, Something. He said, you know what they're doing in Europe now? And I said, well, what are they doing in Europe? He said, they're tuning their violins down a half a step. They're putting on gut strings and using old bows. I said, they're what? Why would they want to do a thing like that? <laughs> you know, as, as a modern freelancer, horrified. 
He was persuasive. So I had an old uh, 17th century German violin lying around. And um, there was a collection in those days of original instruments in original condition, that is, uh, in Connecticut, uh, Larry Whitten. There, those instruments, I believe, now are in, um, in um, is it North Dakota? Uh, Vermilion, South Dakota, yeah. South Dakota, that's yeah. right, yeah, in Vermilion, yeah. Anyway, uh, so we uh, took um, a luthier whose work I admired up with, with us to for her to take some measurements uh, of um, historical violins. And, and so I gave her my 17th century German fiddle and she made a, a what was eventually effectively an 18th century violin, but still with the Baroque neck and all that stuff, you know. So that, that's how I got started. In, in this, uh, Albert and I used to, to concertize around New York. Um, and um, there was a cellist, uh, Fortunato Arico. Um, we used to play together as a trio at times. So, uh, but that, at that time, I, I believe I was the uh, only one in New York who was doing it. I, I know that. Um, Marilyn McDonald was already at Oberlin. I know that um, Sonia Monosoff was up at, uh, at Cornell. But um, uh, there, I, there was I in New York and people sort of saying, you know, what's this kind of weird thing he's doing, you know, suspicious, just as I was when I heard it the first time. Um, he, oh, I, I forgot to tell you that part of it. Uh, at that first meeting with Albert, he played me a recording of um, some uh, European musicians playing original instruments. And I said, Ugh, that doesn't sound like a violin. It sounds like some kind of viol. Uh, but anyway, so I was, uh, as I say, Albert was persuasive. You know, I was not at all impressed with what I heard at first. Anyhow, though, be that as may, um, uh, one thing led to another, and one of the most interesting things that happened was in, um, this was 1970 when I, I left, uh, I joined that group and met Albert. Um, in 1972, in the summer, we, we played a concert up in Aston Magna. A, it was a, an estate had belonged to Albert Spaulding, um, and um, the owner of the property was interested in uh, having concerts in a music room that Spalding had built. So we went up there, we played for the uh, local royalty, you know, the Tanglewood people. And, uh, and um, uh, at, at that, that evening, uh, the idea was, was uh, booted to have a summer workshop a workshop in 18th century style so people could you know rub shoulders with other musicians and so on it and it started in 1973 which is the beginning of Aston Magna um, and well one of the people who came was Jacques Schroeder and August Wenzinger also and the uh, the the Group of dancers, Borough dancers, uh, that uh, Shirley Wynn had um, in Ohio, wasn't it Ohio State or somewhere? Ohio State, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, so anyway, I, just, I got to know them, get a little bit of experience in, in a very crude Baroque dance. And um, I've always said that, you know, learning how to do the minuet changed my right arm forever. It did. <laughs> so anyhow. Um, so that's where all, that's where that started. That was the origin of, of Aston Magna, and uh, of course it's gone on now. It's uh, only a festival. The, the days of the workshop are over, uh, which is a pity in a way because you know one learns so much. You know, well, here's the thing: we were all novices at this. We were learning from, from ground zero. Uh, None of us had any uh, training at that time. We never, none of us took lessons of any kind. We, we listened to each other. We, we thought about the music. We read the appropriate treatises, you know, uh, 
it's about Demignani, uh, E.P. Bach, etc., etc., and that's how we got going. Um, I think it. I think that's the, the really the best way to do it. If you really want to know how to do this. Just start by reading, by experimenting with the instrument to see what it can teach you about what it will tolerate. So, you know, all, all of these things there, I mean, I'm still a student to this day, and I've been teaching at, uh, at IU for 39 years. This is my 39th year there, and um, I, I, um, I, I still learn from my students. Uh, there is uh, one, of, one of the things that happens is I give a course in the interpretation of unaccompanied Bach. And not a week goes by that I haven't discovered something. I don't discover something that is, uh, let's say, maybe I've never seen before, it's possible, or never understood in the way I see it now, or have rethought or have found it to be ambiguous in a very special way, and so on. So uh, Bach has been my focus, uh, the main focus in the last, well, maybe 30 years or so. And, um, but still teaching these students everything from, uh, I like to start them out with early 17th century violin repertoire uh, and walk on through chronologically. And so they can understand the, the way music, the repertoire has evolved. Uh, in, in the succeeding well, century or two, and um, uh, also you know, the technique, <laughs> instrumental technique evolved too, uh, rather dramatically in the 17th century. So, anyway, that's that's my life at the moment, and um, I, I've really enjoyed it. You know, I'm getting toward the end of it, my my my, my career. Uh, you know. Well, I don't know, Stanley. I think you've got a few good sonatas in you. That you you mentioned three different things here that uh, that seem to go together to make it all work. First, sort of the hardware. You said you you had an instrument. You had it fitted up as a baroque instrument, and then you tried to figure out how it works. I mean, nobody told. And then, in order to do that, you take the repertoire and you take the treatises. People who actually said anything about how it works and somehow try to put those three things together and you taught yourself in a way, or as you say, you're still teaching yourself how to, how to play that instrument. Do you think things have, do you think the hardware has changed over time? Are we better at knowing how a Baroque violin uh, should be made or strung or something? Do we know more about bows? Well, possibly, I mean, there, there are so many different types of bow and, and um... You know, experiment with those things. Uh, some of my, my students use bows that I wouldn't know how to use. Uh, uh, you know, we get used to one way of, of doing things, but um, in the way of the hardware, as you put it. Um, I'll tell you something, and this violinist will understand this or be surprised by it. And that is, I commissioned a modern violin. Uh, from Samuel Zygmuntovich a few years ago, the idea of using it for uh, you know, late romantic repertoire, Brahms sonatas or whatever. And, um, uh, the last thing I had Sam do was to carve the neck as a Baroque neck. Because for me, it's so much more comfortable. A modern neck, I wouldn't know what to do with anymore. I always say that, you know, joke about this, that um, so many modern violinists are scared of second position. Well, it's no wonder because they, they, uh, they're they trained at the beginning to play in first position and after six months, if they're very good, they can go to third position. <laughs> well, part of that is because there's, there's nothing, there's no graduation to speak of for the modern neck. So, you know, and, and, uh, the Baroque neck is tapered in such a way that you, you get a very easy sense, relatively, of, of where each position is. 
So um, anyway, that's the answer to what you asked. Well, Aston Magna was uh, uh, such an important institution for many, many years, partly because of the concerts, but maybe at least as much as you say, because of the workshop, people were coming in order to do for themselves what you had done for yourself earlier, namely figure out, uh, first of all, whether I want to play this Baroque music, and second, if I do want to play it, how do I do so? So you had work, you had master classes and things like that, sort of preparing people to go back into the world as Baroque violinists or Baroque musicians. Is that the idea? Oh yeah. Well, a lot of a lot of the initial um, uh, participants were Juilliard students from um, Albert, who knew Albert from their work there. And who, you know, again, were beginners like all of us. And these are the people who've gone out and had the, 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 the been the backbone of, of the uh, early music movement in this country for, for you know for decades. And so yes, it's uh, it's wonderful to to grow like that. But there is no substitute really for for doing your own homework. <laughs> So you, but you had a, a substantial career playing the Baroque violin after Aston Magna, or maybe at the same time as Aston Magna. You played with, I don't know, Smithsonian things. You played with, uh, uh, you played with a certain harpsichordist, a bunch of Bach solos, and uh, and some other things too. I think. Yes, yes. Elizabeth and I have been a duo since 1973. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, made, made some made some beautiful music together. Well, thank you. No, I, I I don't play anymore. My hands are arthritic, so I, I make it you know, sort of noises to demonstrate to my students. But no, there's no more performing. You know, that's in the past. Did you? Uh, what other groups did you play with? Did you play with the Smithsonian folks on, in various iterations? Occasionally, yes. Um, and uh, you know, I did stuff with Hogwood. Too. Had an adventure of music I made some recordings with. Um, well, of course, there, then there was the transition or the evolution from the Baroque to the classical. And so uh, I, I was for 20 years a member of um, the Mozartian players with uh, Stephen Lubin and uh, Myron Lutsky. And that was, that was a wonderful experience. With, uh, we, we recorded all of the Mozart trios and the Mozart piano quartet and, um, and the Schubert, one of the, the Schubert uh, piano trios too. That was, that was wonderful. And did you use different instruments and things for those for those recordings? Yeah, yes, I have a, a, a couple of classical violins. One of them um, is also made by, by Sam Zygmunt Perovich. It's a beautiful instrument and uh, that's what I use for all those recordings. Uh, hmm. Yes. And you've been teaching, you've been teaching in Indiana um, for a long time. Uh, have you always there taught modern and Baroque violin or, I mean, because I think you were there before the Early Music Institute started. Is that right? Are you associated with the Early Music Institute or separate from that? Oh, no, no. That's, that's what I, how I came to be there. Um, uh, and I were down in Australia, actually, at... Um, in 1982, and um, suddenly I get a letter from Tom Binkley uh, here in, in you know, US saying, you know, I started this uh, institute, and would you be interested in, in joining the faculty? And then he said, well, let's give it a shot and see what it's like. And, you know, so 39 years later, you know, <laughs> here we are. Uh, but no, I, 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 I am a member of the string department as well um, and my contact with, with the modern department is not quite the traditional thing i wouldn't i wouldn't even try to get somebody to play a, a romantic concerto um, on the other hand uh, i have this what i told you about the bach interpretation course which is um for modern players um, of the Solo violin and and cello, but, uh, so and that that's my that's my contribution. That's uh, my outreach contribution. 
Well, so um, what's your view on the matter of whether it's a good idea to be a switch hitter? That is, a modern player who also plays Baroque and can take all those jobs for the Messiah this Christmas, as opposed to somebody who is a specialist in just one thing. I mean, you know, from the prof professional point of view, I think it's a wonderful thing if somebody's able to, to play all these different styles. Um, I, I have I've even not too many years ago, you know, here at, at IU, pulled out my modern violin and, and done some some chamber music too. So, not that I've done it professionally on the outside. I mean, there's so much happening in the in the uh, early music profession now that maybe um, people can actually make a living doing just that. But on the other hand, you know, there are certainly people who do both, and there's no reason why not. Uh, you know, it's a violin. <laughs> strings and, you know, uh, you know, maybe a different neck, but that's uh, an option uh, not to have. Um, but, um, you know, essentially it's the same instrument. It's just you just use a different bow, and you just play in a different style. You don't try to get the same volume or, or quality of sound out of, out of the Baroque instrument that you would naturally do with the modern instrument. No, I, I mean, I have had students here. Uh, one, as a matter of fact, was a, a young lady, a, a, a pupil of, of Mauricio Fuchs, who was a dear friend. We, we first met each other when we were both studying with Joe, Joe Fuchs back in 1960. Yeah. So, uh, a student of his uh, who took Baroque lessons with me all the time she was here for four years um, gave her modern uh, degree recital um, on, the, on the Zygmunt Tovich modern violin that I've, I told you about um, because her own violin was you know, not, she wasn't happy with it. So I said, hey, why don't you use this? And indeed, it was the debut of that instrument played um, that, uh, that program, the 10th Beethoven Sonata and the second Prokofiev Concerto using a broad neck. So, and, then, and I said, well, wasn't that a bit awkward? She said, oh, maybe for an hour or so. so ah. but anyway, so, I mean, there's an instance of somebody who is a, a wonderful, she's a wonderful, wonderful violinist, and modern and Baroque, uh, all classical. You, you had occasion to play with a lot of the other sort of uh, Europeans who were sort of discovering things uh, during those same years, didn't you? What, here and there. I don't know who else you played with, but you played with Jop Schroeder, you played with, uh, I, I don't know. What other sort of European folks have uh, have you crossed paths with? Um, mainly, mainly it's been uh, festival situations, as I say, Hogwood. Um, oh, uh, you know, Norrington, um, uh, let me see, I'm thinking about it, and, um, the English concert. Uh, we did one of two things together, but mainly, as I say, it's been that, that kind of situation, not so much chamber music. Right. Um, well, that's great. So, uh, Stanley, what, what advice do you have for uh, people who, uh, who are looking towards the future and not towards the past? The way, uh, I mean, you and I are looking to the future too, but we have maybe a little bit more past behind us than some other people. What do you, what do you see for the future? What do you recommend? And what do you think, what do you think is different today from the way things were when we started? And what do you think, what do you recommend for the future? Well, I mean, about the only advice that I, I think is it's worthwhile is do what you love. If this turns you on, and then go for it, enjoy it. Uh, you can only become a better musician. It's one of the things that's so important about the educational process now, the opportunity that, that people have to learn about how, where we all came from, how um, our art evolved over the centuries. And um, so I, I say, you, you, by 
becoming involved in the in the Baroque thing, uh, you can only grow. You will know much more about Brahms and Mozart from having played um, uh, Giorgio Marini and uh, Schmelzer. <laughs> You can't help but develop in a different way than if you're just doing, you know, the traditional concertos and Paganini caprices and stuff like that. Um, you know, I admire people who can do that, but I pity them at the same time. <laughs> well, for people who have, as a, a lot of the students at Juilliard have, who have already sort of committed themselves to a life in Baroque music, what do you think? What do you think the future is like is likely to be like for them? Who knows? I mean, really, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question because everything is always in process of evolution. Um, uh, things have taken off to the most amazing degree, in the last, as, you, as you well know, in the last uh, 50 years. This country, I mean, starting from nothing virtually to you know a little bit here, a little bit there. To they, they, what should I say? The, the, we're saturated now. Essentially, well, these groups are all over the country, and people doing adventurous things like opera and so on and so forth. So, um, where is the end? Can there be an end to this? I mean, we ran out of repertoire. <laughs> Uh, that would be difficult. There's a lot of repertoire out there. And, uh, so, um, I, I can only think that the, the, the better um, people do it, the more it becomes acceptable, which has been the case. So, I remember a, a, a snotty New York Times critic sort of sniffing, saying, This too shall pass. Hmm. These are the Wheaties' words. I hope. <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> It's, uh, it, I, I really can't, one cannot predict really how it's going to go. That's why I say the best thing to do is to do it as well as you can and um, make music with other people who are on the same level and, and spread the word. It's a very um, sort of an evangelical thing. Um, I think that's the answer. I mean, those are the three answers. Uh, do what you love, do it as well as you can, and do it with other people. And in principle, the rest should take care of itself. Well, I certainly hope you're right, Stanley, and I'm very, very grateful to you for your wisdom and your thoughts on all this. Thank you very, very much, Stanley Ritchie. Well, thank you for inviting me, Tom. Stanley, since uh, the beginning of our talk, I, I believe you said you had some things you wouldn't mind adding you, uh, on reflection about all the time you've spent in the trenches playing your violin and, and working with people. So add whatever you like, please. Okay, well, um, let's go back to the, um, to the time when I uh, left the Metropolitan Opera and discovered the Baroque violin. Um, I played with the New York Chamber Soloists for, for a few years, and um, uh, uh, in 1973, I um, was walking across Central Park one day in a bad mood, and I stopped dead in my tracks and said, why am I living in New York? And I thought for a moment, and the only answer I could come up with was, in order to earn enough money to live in New York. <laughs> There's no reason to live anywhere. I mean, if you have the option. And I, at that time, I said, well, I'm a violinist. I can be wherever I like. So um, I went home, <laughs> opened up a travel magazine, and I found Vancouver, in British Columbia. And I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. So. I went immediately down to the uh, Canadian consulate and um, asked some questions and liked the answers that I heard and uh, went back home again, opened up the International Musician and lo and behold, they're looking for a concert master in Vancouver. <laughs> so I, um, I applied, you know, and uh, 
eventually had an audition um, sort of halfway between here in New York and Vancouver. It was in, um, in Cleveland in the, in the hotel there at the airport <laughs> in a bedroom, played for the concertmaster and the assistant concertmaster. And um, they, uh, they liked what they heard, but they said, you know, I'm afraid the concertmaster job's just been given to a Canadian who has just come back from the concertmaster of London Symphony or something. And uh, I said, oh. They said, would you be interested in the assistant concertmaster position? I said, well, yeah, I just want to live in Vancouver. <laughs> so uh, there it was. I, I, I wound up in Vancouver in 1973. And shortly after um, arriving there, I received a, a postcard from a young woman who had just returned from studying with Leonhardt in Amsterdam. Uh, Elizabeth Wright, and um, she was complaining about the fact she didn't have any um, <clears throat> Baroque violinists or anybody to play with in Portland, where she lived in Oregon. And I said, well, why don't you come up and we'll read some something. And so she did. And the first piece we read was the C minor sonata for harpsichord and violin, obligato harpsichord. And it was instant click. We had nothing to talk about in the way of ensemble. We just played together as though we'd been playing forever. And so that was the beginning of um, what we eventually entitled Duo Gemignani. Um, and we you know, did quite a bit of concertizing um, in the next, uh, well, we had, you know, all the way, certainly until 1982, we were quite active. Um, and then at the same time as I was um, starting out with Elizabeth in the duo, uh, I, I got a phone call from the Philadelphia String Quartet in, in Seattle, <clears throat> uh, looking for a replacement for their first violinist, Rita Reynolds, <laughs> Vita Reynolds, Spoonerisms. Um, and um, I, I auditioned for them and they accepted me, so I moved back, moved down to Seattle, and spent six years with them. So I was, I had two careers going. You, you asked about the, the feasibility of people playing both instruments, modern and baroque. Well, there you are. For six years, I had both careers going parallel, doing a lot of concertizing with with Elizabeth, and and also with the quartet, and. Um, Ultimately, though, it became necessary to make a choice between the two because the careers were colliding too much. And for one reason or another, I, I opted for the Baroque. I mean, I had a wonderful experience with the Philadelphia. We, in, in the six years I was there, we played the Beethoven cycle three times. And that's something that is not just sort of handed to, it, to you on a platter, except it was really in the sense that I had not, I, I've never been cursed with what they call ambition. Things that have happened in my life, in my career, have just sort of happened because I know what I want. I, that is to say, I know what I love. And chamber music was always number one. And um, so the, the quartet was a wonderful experience and the duo was a wonderful experience. But as I say, I found more reasons to go with the, the Baroque violin than, than the modern uh, at that time. Now, uh, that is not to say that I did, that I just stopped totally playing modern violin. It's just a matter of the amount of time, and what you can fit into 24 hours. So um, then, uh, as a matter of fact, after the at the end of those six years, I also received a, um, a an invitation from from Australia, from Sydney, to join the string quartet there, the Sydney quartet. And um, so uh, Elizabeth and I decided, well, let's go down to Australia. Now we were down there for very weren't down there for very long because the job wasn't working out the way we had been led to believe. However. Um, it was just another way of pointing out that I one can do two things at the same time. Yeah. Um, 
around that time, Elizabeth and I had recorded uh, the Bach sonatas for Bach flute and violin uh, in, in London um, as sort of an initial recording uh, experiment. And um, uh, Chris Hogwood happened to hear that, that those tapes. And um, while we were still in Sydney, he sent me an invitation to go on a, a tour with him in a, playing Haydn trios. Um, fortunately, of course, um, as it often happens, we were committed to do something in um, in Sydney at the time, the Sydney Festival, and the um, so I had to, you know, gratefully decline Chris's invitation. Um, but that was only the beginning of a a long relationship with him uh, when he he came to the United States to. Uh, direct the Boston um, Handel and Haydn Society. He invited me to be concertmaster and I had to decline that because I said, well, you know, Boston is Daniel Stepner's territory, not mine. So it would be unethical of me to say yes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Chris persisted and you know, eventually we, I did stuff with the Academy of Ancient Music uh, recording with them. But um, what I wanted just to point out was this, that it is certainly possible for anybody who really wants to do it to play all, to play both violins. I mean, what happened, of course, in my, um, uh, as, as well as the, um, the uh, working with Hogwood, which was on a actually on classical violin, we were doing you know, classical repertoire, Mozart, Haydn, etc., in the mostly Mozart in New York. And um, so there was number three, three violins, three different, I mean, I mean, literally, I have three different violins, one for each uh, period. So um, Ultimately, as I said, around the same time that uh, I received the invitation from Hogwood, I got a letter from Thomas Binkley telling, telling me and Elizabeth about the launching of the Early Music Institute in, in, in Bloomington and um, inviting us to come up and you know, audition for the job. Would be what would be would be interested in joining the faculty, and so we thought, no, oh, heck, as it happened, we had a tour up in in the states at that time, um, Elizabeth and I. So um, when we came up, we we came to to Vancouver. <laughs> Sorry, we came to Seattle, and what am I saying? You came to Indianapolis. I mean, to uh, Bloomington. Yes, Bloomington. <laughs> so much going on. Yeah, yeah. To Bloomington, and uh, we were, uh, you know, offered the job, and we accepted. So that's how that started. But when I arrived in, in Bloomington with that job, and I mark you, you know, thirty-nine years ago, I hadn't done very much teaching at all, so I had to learn on the job. Uh, so. Um, Whereas Elizabeth and I kept um, concertizing, and I was doing a lot with classical, as I spoke about the, um, the uh, Mozartian players. But um, actually, I, I used to do some stuff with Malcolm Bilson as well, and, uh, and also Anna Bielsma. Uh, that was wonderful, you know, playing a trio with them for a little. And Anna also played with Elizabeth and me. So. That was you now again one of the one of the wonderful things that's happened in in, in my career. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, the the teaching full time in Bloomington meant I really couldn't maintain the modern violin as well as the other two. Now that is not to say that I absolutely put the modern violin away for all time. Not at all. Uh, in my time here in Bloomington, I have. 
um, performed on modern violin, chamber music, uh, the oh, wonderful Shostakovich program that piano trio and piano quintet and Dvorak quintet and so on, you know. So um, I, come again, I come back again to your original question. Yes, anybody who really wants to do it can play all of these instruments and maintain them if he has the time. So that's great. And have you have you taught both instruments at Bloomington? Uh, not exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't dare to um, try to teach somebody a, a romantic concertos. Right. Um, but uh, the other side of it is there that I've always given this course in Bach interpretation, the solos and solo violin and cello pieces. And um, that's for modern players. So in that sense, I have been, you know, teaching modern violin, but that's particular repertoire. And many of your Baroque violins uh, students, of which there have been many, have many of them at least have continued to be players on the modern violin too. Is that right? Yes, certainly. Yeah, uh, most recent, of course, Rachel Wong, mm -hmm. who plays magnificent both instruments. Well, you have a you have a, a lot to be proud of, and we have a great deal to be thankful for, for your music making and your training of musicians over many many decades. It's amazing that a man as spry and articulate as you can have can have taught quite so many people, Stanley. But on behalf <laughs> of many generations of musicians and listeners, thank you very much, Stanley Ritchie. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure talking to you and it's been a wonderful experience teaching.